Um, so we're just going to pick up and hopefully tie some of this together. Um, I was thinking about um, one way to break down attachment theory and, and how it, it, it relates to some of the themes that we've been talking about. And I'm not sure if this is the right way to do it, but it's the way that, that seems uh, to kind of jump out to me. We have, in a way, the, the, how attachment influences our receptivity to various moods and emotions. And remember, moods and emotions have like uh, a quality of an openness to different kinds of ways of relating to other people, to the world. It's what allows things to, to show up as mattering in various ways. And so how we are kind of dialed into the world um, through our moods and emotions has uh, uh, um, attachment theory and, and those relationship dynamics will play a big role in that. In other words, someone who is avoidantly, has an avoidant attachment style, their way of being in the world vis-a-vis uh, -vis moods and emotions is very different from someone who has a secure attachment style, uh, someone who's more open and receptive to various moods and emotions. Attachment theory ha plays a, a big role in how we come to regulate our emotions, how we come to tolerate various emotions. So there's this kind of, you know, we find ourselves in various dispositions or moods or emotions. There's that aspect, that part of it. There's the part as it relates to our socio-emotional bonds, our ways of relating to other people, especially in a more intimate way. In, in a sense, it's, it's our sort of, um, our projecting into social possibilities, possibilities that occur to us as, you know, worth engaging, or it's, it's again, this sort of familiar background understanding of how we relate to one another, especially in an emotional sense. And then part of this uh, as well, and these are not mutually exclusive kind of categories or something like that in a reductive way, it's just dip highlighting different parts of this big holistic uh, phenomenon. But there's this intuitive self-understanding that does the individual experience themselves as, as worthy, as lovable, as, as worth caring about, or will they come to have an intuitive understanding of themselves as conditional? Um, so, you know, one way of tying this together is to say that attachment relationships affect our way of being in the world through an openness to various moods and emotions uh, and how the world, including our being with others, gets disclosed as mattering or not. So we left off um, just beginning down this road of, of, you know, laying out the different attachment styles and what they look like. We talked about a secure attachment as involving a dynamic where the caregiver is emotionally available, they're perceptive, they're responsive, uh, they're able to regulate the child's mood and their emotion uh, and anxiety. The child feels secure, there's minimal distress when they're separated from the parent in the strange situation, they're, they're uh, assured that the parent is going to return. And if the child is distressed, if they have this secure attachment dynamic, they just intuitively you know, seek out or, or look to the parent you know, to offer comfort or support. Now, we were you know, walking through this in terms of like a, a larger narrative, like what this would look like. And we talked about, okay, well, with a secure attachment dynamic, we have a parent who is, again, think of just how the parent has to be situated in terms of you know, their moods and, and emotions. There has to be an openness to being moved by the distress of the, uh, the child, and they're able to pick the child up, they're able to you know, comfort them through their just eye contact, their tone of voice, their just relaxed way of being with them, and they effectively are able to move the state through their body, they're able to move that state of the dysregulated child into a state of relative calm or equanimity. And this happens repeatedly over and over, and the child is more effectively able to regulate their own distress. We talked about when that child becomes a toddler, now they're, you know, beginning to learn language. The parent is through just a tenacious wanting to, to be connected with the child around their distressing feelings. They're asking questions. Are you okay? Are you upset? Did something happen? Uh, were you mad because, you know, someone, um, you know, said something mean or took something away from you that they excluded you? Like, what, what is this about? And so a parent in playing this sort of wondering game, again, they, they kind of hit the, the correct interpretation or something that comes close to the child's experience and the child feels in some way that the parent gets it. And again, if the parent is open and receptive in their own emotional capacity, they're feeling something for the child. The child experiences themselves mattering, right? And they feel this sense of, of uh, connectedness. And again, there's something about this that makes these emotions that are almost unbearable in isolation, they now become 
bearable in this sort of joint um, uh, connectedness ar around these feelings. Um, the other thing that we didn't really emphasize too much, but uh, the self-understanding part, right? So uh, one way of thinking about this is that you, in a way, you learn about yourself through the eyes of other people. You learn about yourself through the eyes of your primary caregivers. And so, you know, for instance, you, the child might learn that they're funny because, you know, they're, their dad laughs at their little one-liners as they're learning to speak. Um, they learn that they're lovable because their mother and father, you know, seek them out and give them hugs and kisses and say, I love you and snuggle at bedtime and that sort of thing. They don't have to ask for this sort of thing. It just happens, right? And they're not thinking about it. It's just the way that the world works. Um, they, learn, um, they learn that they're caring because, you know, the parents point out or, you know, comment on just how nice they are to a sibling or something like that. Um, you learn all these things about yourself and, and you learn it in, in this just sort of way that is just kind of disclosed or revealed to you. It's not something that you necessarily learn in a, a conceptual way. It's, it's just this intuitive understanding. And again, just by virtue of the fact that you know, someone is willing and, and you know, wanting to be present with you in your emotional distress, there's this intuitive sense that, that my feelings matter and that I matter. And a person who has this sort of secure attachment dynamic they tend to become individuals who have this intuitive sense of just an unconditional worth that I'm worth caring about. Um, does that make sense? So that kind of clarifies the, the secure stuff and we'll just move along and see what this looks like. So an avoidant attachment dynamic occurs where the caregiver is emotionally neglectful, they're imperceptive, they're, they're not really in tune with or able to kind of perceive what's happening on an emotional level with their child. And so they're, they're non-responsive or they respond in inappropriate ways and they can be dismissive or rejecting. When we think about the, the psychological state of the parent, the parent arguably is, is closed off in some ways, you know, that they're not able to you know, be moved in the same way as a securely attached individual um, uh, playing the role of parent. So, I mean, this, this can happen just in you know, some rather obvious ways where a parent is saying like, you know, you have nothing to cry about. Why don't you go to your room? If you're going to cry about that, I'll, I'll give you something really to cry about, right? Or a parent can say, you know, well, other kids have it worse. You know, this isn't really that bad. Um, sometimes what can happen is something that is, it, it, it's not intuitively obvious, like how, how this can play into the attachment dynamics, but sometimes parents can just you know, encourage their child to avoid engaging with emotions. And they can do this that when their child is upset, they'll say, here, play with this iPad, right? Go busy yourself, you know? Or look, why don't you just go play games with your sister or something like that? It's a nice day, just, just go out there and just, you know, have fun or something. And in a way, it's, again, it's, it's so there's a, a lack of curiosity or a willingness to engage with what the child is feeling. And it's effectively teaching them to avoid or distract from, you know, their their moods and their emotions as, as they're felt. So what happens is, is at least in, in a strange situation, there's, there's really no preference between the caregiver and the stranger. The caregiver, in other words, isn't able to, to give them much of anything in an emotion regulation sense above and beyond what, what a stranger would. So there's almost like an, an indifference to that. They tend not to cry during separation. Uh, they generally avoid the caregiver and proximity seeking behaviors are inhibited. And so there's this uh, tendency toward a, a compulsive self-sufficiency uh, with this style of attachment. Um, was there a question that someone had about, yeah? Yeah, I was just wondering if um, the kind of response in how you go for caregiving. Well, it's, it's all a matter of balance, I think, too, right? I should say that. So um, like ideally in the perfect world, you have a parent that is able to just engage just a little bit at least with whatever that feeling is. And then if you know, a bit of distraction or something like that helps a person kind of settle their emotions, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. The problem is that if that is the only approach that a parent is able to take, um, you know, and so far as like other, you know, in daycare, I would hope that in a daycare setting that, that you would have, again, like uh, adults who are able to you know, comfort and soothe and, and whatnot. Um, but I mean, really, if you have one person in your life who is able to fill that sort of role of being emotionally attuned um, and drawing attention to what you're experiencing and whatnot, that seems to be enough. 
uh, in most cases. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, now, an anxious, ambivalent attachment style seems to happen where you have a caregiver uh, that is inconsistently available, they're inconsistently perceptive, and they're inconsistently responsive. So sometimes they're emotionally available and attuned and able to perceive what's going on with their child, and other times they're, they're not. Um, and this can happen you know, for a number of different reasons. You know, just you know, one example is, is if you have a parent that is uh, an alcoholic, and it could be that um, you know, when they're not drinking, they're, they're a reasonably good parent. Uh, they're able to, you know, comfort the child and, and be there for them and, and be curious about their inner experiences and so on. But when they're drinking, they become just flat and unemotional and unavailable. Or worse, they can become, um, you know, aggressive or mean or, or dismissing. Um, and sometimes parents can be overbearing or intrusive. So, uh, you know, this may happen with a parent who has this like they're they're revving at a high level of anxiety they're they're constantly worried and concerned about if their child is okay if their child is doing the right thing if they sh maybe shouldn't be doing something else and you know a child might be just you know sitting there kind of playing with blocks or something like that and because the parent thinks that it's a good thing they just run in and scoop them up and they they pick them up and they do what they think they would enjoy better or something like that and to the child that can be like really intrusive like where did this come from um, Sometimes uh, a parent can themselves, because they anticipate that when their child is upset that it's somehow their job to, to make this feeling go away or something. If they can't do it, then it somehow reflects negatively upon them and they become emotionally dysregulated or, or really upset or overwhelmed uh, when their child is, is uh, experiencing some distressing feeling. Now the child intuits this and, you know, of course, that's even more distressing to see the parent, you know, distressed in, in this uh, upsetting way. Um, and so they, they adapt uh, to this situation. So the child becomes effectively um, anxious or uneasy or preoccupied with their parent. So they're, in a way, they're trying to read the parent or read the situation, whether the parent is likely to be overwhelmed, whether the parent is going to be intrusive or overbearing. Um, whether it's the appropriate timing or, or whatnot to, to go to them with some issue. And, uh, but the, the uh, characteristic is, is, uh, is characterized largely by anxiety. So as, as we can imagine, that, that motivation for exploration and mastery of the world, just you know, uh, having this openness that allows you to kind of explore things and learn about yourself and your abilities and, and all that kind of stuff, is in a way inhibited. So it's conditional on the presence, the support, and the approval of these attachment figures. Now, when, when individuals who grow up in this kind of environment, uh, and again, all, the, all of this is, is we want to keep in mind, like very much implicit, right? It's, it's usually not something that we're consciously aware of. Um, when they become adults, they, they tend to, uh, well, when you ask them as, as a therapist, you say, well, look, you know, wouldn't it be good to um, you know, to share some of this with like your best friend or, or talk to your partner about these issues that we've been describing? Or wouldn't it be good to just expand this a little bit beyond, you know, the confines of the therapy office? And, you know, a person who grows up in an environment like this will often say things like, well, I, I wouldn't want to put that on someone, right? Now, what does that imply, you know, to say, I don't want to put that on someone? What it implies that it's a, it's a weight, it's, it's a burden of some kind. Right, um, and sometimes people will say, "Well, I I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to be an inconvenience. I don't want to be a bother." And you know, when you ask, "Well, well, look, you know, this friend uh, it has been a friend for a long time. Have they ever said to you, like, like, look, this is this is too much. I I can't handle it. It's a bother. It's annoying. Like, have they ever expressed that to you? You know, and often it's it's when they think about it, it's like, well, no, they they haven't done that. So. But that feeling is there, right? So this feeling must come from somewhere. It doesn't come from nowhere. Um, and this is often the kind of experience that, um, that can give rise, rise to that sort of thing. Um, in addition, uh, we'll kind of talk about this a little bit later, but they, a person who kind of experiences these sort of things, they, they have this, this sense of their worth as being conditional. So in other words, if, if I am able to 
you know, say the right things or be the right way or, or not upset someone or not rock the boat, not cause a fuss, then this person will like me. Then I'll be okay in this relationship, you know. So their worth, in a way, is, is felt uh, to be conditional. Now, the last attachment style that we'll talk about is this uh, disorganized um, attachment style. And it, it tends to happen where the caregiver is frightening or frightened or alarmed. Uh, these are usually you know, quite extreme behaviors, like you can think in terms of you know, abuse and neglect and, and things of that nature. And what happens is that the child tends to have a disorganized or a disoriented uh, way of being in, in the, the parent's presence. Um, so there's no adaptive behavioral strategy. Um, so when you think about the other attachment styles, right? Like, well, the secure attachment style is, is adaptive because there's an openness to, to feeling. And there's, you know, when a person is overwhelmed, they just intuitively reach out to close friendships or romantic partners or what have you. Uh, it's adaptive. The avoidance style is adaptive as well, especially in childhood, because, you know, if there's an emotionally unavailable parent, well, then there's this, this kind of reflexive avoidance or, you know, repression of salient emotions, right? You just dull your emotional um, sort of receptivity. This isn't a conscious thing, by the way. This is just all involuntary, or it's voluntary rather, but it's not something Arguably, it's, it's voluntary, but it's not something that, um, that a person is aware of doing. The anxious ambivalent style is, is adaptive because it, it means that, well, I can manage the situation by just attending very, very carefully to other people and their facial expressions and their mannerisms and their way of being, and I just you know, walk around on eggshells with this anxiety and apprehensiveness, and if I can just be really, really careful about what I'm doing, then I can be safe in this relationship. So that's adaptive. But, but this style, is, is, uh, it's not adaptive. Arguably, what's happening much of the time is, is that the, the child is entering into um, like a freeze response, which is, again, that parasympathetic anxiety that you just get flooded with, with this, um, well, for many people, it's this nauseous feeling. This, this body just shuts down. There's a drop in blood pressure. You lose your ability to kind of think clearly. And, and for many people, it's a dissociative kind of state, right? Like you kind of check out in a way. Um, but they're not able to do anything really with, uh, uh, with regard to the, you know, the relationship dynamics. So they may freeze with a trance-like expression, engage in self-soothing, rocking behavior, and so on. So this is uh, the most severe type. Uh, it's, it's also the, the least common. Uh, it's more common, obviously, in, in uh, clinical uh, samples. Okay, so, so that was a rundown on uh, just attachment theory as it shows up roughly in childhood, and now we're just going to carry that over and see, well, what does this look like through development? What does this look like, especially in adulthood? So we might say, well, how do you measure attachment in adulthood? It's not like you can kind of get two people who are in a romantic relationship, put them in a room and ask one of them to leave, and then watch you know, this anxiety unfold. That's not going to work that way, right? Um, so we have the adult attachment interview, and, and this is roughly how it works. So you have a researcher or a clinician who would ask questions um, about uh, the individual's childhood, important relationships, important emotional relationships, difficult experiences that they might have had, uh, whether they've encountered any, anything that might be considered traumatic, um, times when they were upset, times that they, when they were hurt, and, uh, and curious about all these sorts of things. Um, you know, as, as an aside, I, sh I should, you know, just remind us, my sense is I don't think anyone makes it to adulthood completely unscathed, right? Um, so I think, like, everyone surely, uh, you know, even in the most wonderful childhoods, I, I think, you know, we have moments where, of course, we felt, you know, extremely hurt or upset or disappointed or lonely or whatever, right? That's, that's just part of, um, you know, unfortunately or unfortunately, that's just part of human existence, right? So we're just curious about these different experiences. But we're not interested in so much the content. We're not interested in, you know, the, the, quote, facts of what did or didn't happen. That's not what we're interested in, right? What we're interested in is more of the, the qualitative response, right? We're interested in 
in the coherence of, of their narrative, in their understanding of their experiences and the memories that, that they recall. We're looking for, you know, maybe kind of large gaps in, in recollection that, that could be there. Whether there's a preoccupation with, with uh, different parts of, of an individual's uh, history, environment, uh, excessive anger, excessive passivity, a vagueness ar around these discussions, or a dismissing attitude as, as it relates to some of these experiences. So it's not like, um, it's not like you're asking questions and, and you can assess, okay, well, this person has experienced something traumatic and therefore they're, you know, we're gonna categorize them as insecurely attached. It's not what it's about. It's, it's about like how they respond to these, these questions. Um, so the responses are coded and they're rated. And you would roughly be able to kind of um, you lump people into one of these different attachment categories. I, I should say as well that, you know, this is just a rough way of, of trying to understand like certain personality styles. Um, and these categories, um, there is some overlap as far as I can tell, right? Like people will maybe kind of have a mix of like an avoidant and, and an anxious kind of disposition or way of being, that's not uncommon. Um, and people can be like mostly securely attached, but they might have like a tilting or an orienting toward more of an avoidant dynamic or something like that. So just keep all that in mind. So someone who has a secure attachment uh, in adulthood, it, it, again, it tends to develop from a secure child attachment. They have a relatively free and autonomous state of mind or a way of being. So you can think about it in terms of like there's, there's an openness. We talked about, you know, well, what is, what is a healthy personality? Well, arguably a healthy personality is a person who is open to different ways of thinking, different moods and emotions that could show up, and, you know, different ways of acting, you know, depending on the context or the situation. They tend to value relationships, right? That relationships have, you know, some importance, that it, it matters, right? They tend to be flexible and relatively objective. And so an example of that, like they can see within themselves, for example, they can see that, you know, there are parts of themselves that obviously need a hell of a lot of work and are lacking and, you know, things that they're not good at. And, uh, and, and also they can see the positive aspects in, of themselves as well. And they can look at other people in the same way that, that you're not perfect. I'm not going to put you up on some ridiculous pedestal. And I don't feel a need like I have to knock you down, you know, to, to somehow boost myself up in some relative sense. I can see you as imperfect, as, as flawed, and I can see the good in you as well. So there's this sort of objectivity um, to how the individual encounters the world. They can integrate the past with the present and the anticipated future. So there's this you know, coherence of, of life narrative. Doesn't mean that the individual didn't experience you know, difficult things, right? So a person who has a secure attachment dynamic in the adult attachment interview, it might sound something like, well, yeah, um, I grew up and, and dad was in the military and he would go away for up to six months at a time. And man, my God, that was really hard. And you know, my mom, it, it was hard on her and it caused a lot of stress at home. And my sister was, was dealing with these, you know, kind of learning disability issues in school and, and it caused a lot of stress and it was really tough. And at times I felt really lonely because mom didn't have as much time for me. And you know, that has impacted, like sometimes I tread lightly in relationships and I, I tend not to express my needs and whatnot. But going forward, like I know that's something that I need to continue to work on. And, and it's something that I have worked on and, and it's, it's uh, you know, uh, brought about some really interesting things in my life. So someone like that, they experienced something that, that was tough and difficult and hard or whatever. But, but again, they, they have this way of tying all this stuff together and, and you know, they have a, a deep understanding of how these things have arguably affected them. About 50 to 60 percent of adults will have this, uh, this sort of secure attachment style. Now, a dismissing attachment uh, involves a minimization and avoidance of emotion by engaging in defensive strategies. Again, th these are not, you know, the person is not aware that they're engaging in such strategies, including repression, which is the inhibition of emotions that the body intuits is, is overwhelming or, or too much to deal with. Distraction, just engaging in, you know, just avoidance, just, 
you know, so a person who is an adult, so as a kid it might be like video games, but as an adult it might be just like they become a workaholic. They just throw themselves into the, their work when they're dealing with a certain amount of stress um, in, uh, in their life in, in a relational sense. Intellectualization, being able to deal with concepts and abstractions and generalizations in this more detached way that gets them some distance from the felt experience. And rationalization, so you know, offering some logical justification that would also seem to take away from the, the first person experience. You know, so someone might say, well, yeah, I was, I was beaten as a kid and my father was, was you know, kind of really hard on me and, and whatnot. But you know, the, the environment that I grew up in, like, I mean, ev everyone's father did that, right? And surely other, other you know, parents were w way worse than my father was. Well, all that may be true, but um, it, in that context, it, it may kind of take away from, well, what was this like for you? I mean, surely it's, it still had some impact on you. It still shaped you in some way. They tend to be extremely dry and logical and analytical. Um, when you ask them more, um, more intimate questions or, or questions in, in the first person as it relates to emotions and relationships, they tend to almost not understand the question. They try to turn it into an analytical question. Um, they become very uncomfortable. Sometimes you see them in a therapy context. They, they, uh, they, they almost they speak about themselves in the second person, right? which is just a subtle little, little thing. Um, so when you ask them about their, their upbringing and, and whatnot, they might say, well, you know, you, you just deal with it. You just you, you carry on your life and you just, you know, and well, what is this you? Like, do you, do you mean like you as an I, like in this sense? Or like, are you speaking in general here? And again, this is just a subtle little shift that, that can take away from uh, an awareness of, of how these things affected the individual. They often have incongruent or incoherent adult attachment narratives. So when you ask them about their childhood, so when, you know, Again, my sense is that like no one makes it to adulthood completely unscathed, right? So when you ask someone, well, can you tell me a little bit about, about your childhood? Can you tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up? Can you tell me about your relationship with your parents? And when someone immediately jumps in with, oh, it was wonderful, it was perfect, right? I'm immediately, I'm a little bit suspicious because I don't think anyone has a perfect childhood, do they? Like, I'm, I'm sure they can have quite a good childhood, right? But you know, there's, there's pros and cons for everyone, I think. Um, but, you know, so someone who, you know, so you ask someone, well, tell me about, um, tell me about your, your parents' relationship with one another as, as you remember it, like as you remember it growing up. Oh, it was wonderful. It was good. You know, very loving. Okay. Can you tell me what that looks like? What was normal? Okay. Well, pretend I don't know what normal is, right? Um, what would that have looked like? You know, would they have been physically affectionate with one another? Would, they, would you see them give each other hugs and kisses? Would they hold hands sometimes? Would you ever overhear one of them say, I love you? You know? Well, no, none of that. Okay, well, so in what sense was, was, it, was it loving or whatever? Well, dad would, you know, carry his weight and he would go to work and he would, you know, be responsible and he'd do his thing and, and it seemed to work. Okay, but in an emotional sense, like, were they, did, would you get the sense that they're emotionally connected or close with one another? And, you know, and there things kind of may unfold in a way like, well, they would, they would argue and they'd fight and they'd yell and, you know, sometimes mom would throw things and, and whatnot. And, and, and so then this initial kind of comment that oh, they had this wonderful relationship, you know, on, on deeper exploration, well, it doesn't really seem to add up here based on some of these things that, that, you're, that you're sharing here. So sometimes there can be this, this inconsistency there. They tend to be emotionally inflexible. Um, again, we talked about how you know, children who, who don't have parents uh, that are tenaciously curious about their, their experiences and, and their feelings, they, they tend to have a limited uh, emotional vocabulary. Well, adults are the same thing. You ask them, well, you know, asking about something that, that presumably was, was quite hard, um, and you ask what that was like, and they will say things like, well, it wasn't good. Okay. So we have good over here, and good, I presume, is, you know, this wonderful, joyous openness, a warm, fuzzy feeling, right? It's, there's that, that's good, and what you're saying is that it's not that, right? So what is it then, you know? So it's almost like 
there's a very limited vocabulary, a very limited capacity. It's not even just vocabulary, I would say. It's a limited capacity for even attending to or noticing that there are other feelings there at all. They tend to be emotionally disengaged from others. Um, they often lack this autonoetic consciousness or memory. Autonoetic means a, a, a memory or, or an awareness of like your life memories over, over time. You know, so they will often say things like, well, when you ask about their history, they'll say things, well, my God, like, who has memories before age seven? Like, I don't remember anything before seven. I have vague mem memories of like 11 or 12. Like, does anyone really remember that sort of thing? Well, yeah, I think a lot of, um, some of the memories may be a little bit fuzzy or whatever, but, but lots of people do, certainly, you know. So there can be this, uh, this gap in, in recollection. They're extremely protective of their independence and need for psychological distance, detachment, and control. Um, they may have a lot of friends. This, this is important to keep in mind. They may have a lot of friends, but they're not emotionally close with, with really any of them. It's more that they have like a lot of acquaintances. They have a lot of people that they might do things with, um, but they don't have many people that they would share things with, like in a, in a more intimate sense or an emotional capacity. And, you know, they're implicitly distrustful. They're, they're just distrustful of, of, you know, other people if they were to, to get closer to them. They're not aware of this. The, the anxious individual is arguably a little bit more aware of this. Um, so again, like this person, you might ask them, well, look, um, we, we talked about something really important in our sessions. You know, you've been with your partner for three years. You know, are you talking about how the sessions are going? Are you talking about some of the things that we're getting into? Um, because that would seem to be really important. And they might say, well, well, no. Well, why would I? Well, why wouldn't you? And they might say something like, well, it's personal. Yes, exactly, right? Well, that's what a relationship is. A relationship is, is personal, right? It's, it's a, inviting someone else to be a part of your life in some meaningful way. Um, so again, there's this implicit uh, distrust around that. They generally avoid vulnerability in relationships. And uh, to someone who is of a secure attachment style, it, they will strike them as, as cold or detached or just emotionally unavailable. They're very reluctant to seek emotional support, unsurprisingly, um, or comfort from others if they're dealing with a lot of stress um, or being overwhelmed in some way. Um, any questions about, about that? There's this interesting kind of piece that kind of fits into this as well. When you ask about like someone's childhood and you ask about what it was like for them and so on, um, oftentimes, like, people will say, like, well, I, I was loved growing up, right? And, but when you ask about, well, how did you know that you were loved? And sometimes people will say things like, well, why else would my father work so hard to, you know, to make sure that, that we were provided for? You know, why else would my mother drive me here or there or do these things with me, right? And I think there's an important difference between, you know, knowing that you were loved or being able to infer that you were loved and, and feeling it, right? They're not quite the same thing. It doesn't mean that a parent doesn't love you if, if they're doing more of those instrumental things, but it's not quite the same as, as being able to um, connect in a more emotional way that, that we're, uh, we're getting at here. So preoccupied attachment, this is the adult version of the anxious ambivalent style. Uh, an individual will view relationships as uncertain, as unreliable. They have this anxious preoccupation with one's partner and the possibility of rejection. It doesn't have to be a partner, by the way. This, this could be just a friendship. So this anxious worry that um, that they're going to say the wrong thing, that their partner might be mad at them. They're usually, you know, very averse to, you know, quote unquote conflict, right? Like the, any kind of disagreement that could cause the other person to be upset. And there's this anxious needing to kind of check in with the other person. Like, are we okay? Did I do something wrong? Are you mad at me? Are you sure you're not mad at me? You know, this kind of thing. 
um, which if there's a lot of that, you can imagine how someone on the other end of that would start to feel. It would start to feel quite frustrating or you're not sure how to assure this person or, or what they need to hear. So they tend to be hypervigilant and hyper-responsive to social cues, uh, cues of possible criticism or disapproval. And it leads to an impaired objectivity and uh, premature attributions. So, you know, they're, they're just in this hypervigilant, sort of anxious disposition, ready to be, you know, uh, I don't know, concerned about judgment or criticism, you know, to be, you know, to, to discover that they're inadequate in the eyes of another person, you know, this kind of thing. Their self-worth and acceptance is implicitly conditional, so the fear is that they're not, not good enough as they are, that they have to go above and beyond in some way to secure you know, that, that, that love or connection with another person. So they can be like, um, uh, like excessive people pleasers, like they're, they're always trying to kind of you know, do what they think the other person expects or needs or wants. And you know, unfortunately, like their, their own needs and feelings get shuffled off into the background, right? They don't really get attended to at all. And why is that? Well, you ask people, and again, it's that thing, well, I don't want to be a burden. Well, look, you know, you've just described yourself being like an amazing listener to this friend. You know, they have all these issues that they're struggling with. Like, do you consider them to be burdensome? Is that burdensome when you're listening to them, when you're really showing that you care, that it matters? Is that a burden? Well, no, of course not. Well. Well, what is this about then? So it's, it's a burden, you know, when you're the one in need, right? But, but it's not for them. Like, what is this, what is this about? So again, it, it doesn't, it's, it's not like a logical, rational um, kind of process. It's this intuitive kind of felt way of being. They may present as clingy and demand frequent reassurance from their partners, or they may be excess, excessively submissive, passive, overly compliant or controlling and manipulative in relationships, you know, they can, um, you know, like you didn't answer your phone last night at 9.35. Where were you? Um, I was, I don't know, I was maybe taking a shower, maybe I was, you know, talking to my friend, whatever. Are you sure? Because I dropped by your apartment and, and you weren't there. I knocked three times. Well, gosh, I don't know, like maybe I, I don't know what, where I was or whatever. There's this anxiety and this distrustfulness uh, that, that can kind of play out in, uh, in a way where, uh, where it creates a lot, of, a lot of tension in these relationships. There's an unwillingness to really trust uh, at times. And they can bribe or, or threaten other people into providing affection. Um, so they can become, you know, overly flirtatious with people to try to either you know, make the other person feel so, so jealous that they're, you know, anxiously clinging to this relationship, um, you know, or they're kind of reducing themselves to what they can offer in terms of their physicality or something like that. The, uh, so the last one, the unresolved or disorganized attachment, it tends to develop from a disorganized child attachment. In the adult attachment interview, when you're discussing loss or abuse, the person has lapses in reasoning or discourse. Uh, there could be this, this uh, you know, abrupt silence or disorganized speech. Uh, a person becomes suddenly overwhelmed. And again, this, this will often happen when a person uh, kind of suddenly flips into that sort of freeze response, um, you know, where their thinking becomes suddenly clouded. They begin to dissociate a little bit. Uh, they may get like the ringing in their ears and this, you know, tunnel vision sensation and they just become so dysregulated and overwhelmed that they can't really cope in that moment. And this is sometimes characterized as uh, fragile therapy clients, at least from uh, some of the psychodynamic literature. Um, this is also quite common with uh, uh, persons who are diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. So um, you can think of, I think the right way to think of borderline personality disorder is a disorder of emotion regulation, that this is a person who has a very, very difficult time tolerating emotions, different kinds of emotions, without being so overwhelmed by them or, you know, without them, the feeling itself being immediately translated into action, right, spilling over into action. So someone who has that, that uh, diagnosis, they can become 
very, very quick to anger and uh, raging against others and accusing them of all sorts of things, or they can just become overwhelmed with shame and feeling terrible about themselves. Um, you know, or they can just become just overwhelmed and, and shut down and dysregulated quite, quite easily. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about emotion regulation. Uh, and this is from the, uh, the Siegel chapter. Attachment helps the immature brain use the mature functions of the parent's brain to organize its own processes. So again, if, if you're curious about what's going on, maybe on a, a more material efficient level of causality, this is you know, likely what's happening. Um, Alan Shore's work, again, is, is uh, you know, brilliant on, on this stuff. So if you're curious about that, uh, check it out. Emotion regulation, again, is the ability to tolerate and modulate emotions without becoming completely overwhelmed by them or engaging in avoidance strategies that serve to detach from the emotional experience involving distraction, intellectualization, rationalization, and so on. Um, in my mind, uh, that's so therapy, uh, you know, a big part of therapy, at least the kind of therapy that I do, involves helping people, you know, regulate uh, emotions, right? So we, we pay attention to things that, that the client themselves may not pay attention to. They don't notice. Um, and why don't they notice it? Because a lot of these things are operating on a preconceptual level. They're just sort of on this intuitive level, um, a level of relatedness or, or just, you know, how things unfold in the conversation. Um, and you notice you know, patterns of avoidance, and you draw their attention to patterns of avoidance, and you see if they're in agreement that, that, yeah, I think I am avoiding something here. And you try to get them closer to whatever it is that's being avoided. And, and often that's, that's some, some feeling, some part of their experiential reality. And you try to help them engage with that in a way that is tolerable, in a way that is not going to overwhelm them. Um, so you're building a capacity for regulating emotions. And in the avoidance style, it's moving away from what is. Well, what, what, what is that? Well, that's, that's the, the feeling, the experience that shows up in the first person. A person is not in the business of, of regulating their emotions when they're in that sort of attachment dynamic. They're coping, right? And again, we don't want to be dismissive of that. I think we want to have a healthy appreciation of that. Well, my God, of course, they're going to cope because that's what was needed. Right? The question is, you know, is this habit or style of dealing with your own emotions and ways of relating to people, is that still useful to you? And that's not for the therapist to decide that, and the therapist isn't going to judge or whatever. I mean, it's for the client to come to that realization if that's working for them or not. Um, so caregivers can amplify the child's positive emotional states and modulate negative ones. I think we know that. I wanted to show this video, uh, you guys probably seen this, the still face experiment. Um, uh, Dr. Tronic, I think, is just explaining this. And again, it just gives us a visceral um, sense of what this, uh, what this looks like. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying 30, 40 years ago, when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I'm like a girl. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this, and then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? 
even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. So you can see that, that reciprocal kind of back and forth flow of emotional states between the mother and the child here. And when, so when the mother is engaging in that still face, I mean, we can sense that, that that's quite difficult for the mother to do at a certain point, yeah? And, and how do we notice that? Hmm? She's kind of blinking, almost like this is kind of almost intolerable, this is painful. Now, arguably, she is, there's, there's an openness to her way of being that she can be moved by, by the emotional state of, of the child. Like if she was just really doped up or like, you know, the most hardened, avoidant, you know, individual at all, like there wouldn't be anything there. It would be like maybe just like a conceptual, like, uh, are you sure this is okay? Should I just continue this or, you know, uh, or just trying to, figure things out in, in, uh, in some rational way, what needs to be done. Um, you know, I guess another thing is, is that, uh, so the good, bad, and, and the ugly, right? Um, even in, in the, the best sort of environments, again, there's no such thing as a perfect parent, right? A parent is going to make mistakes. A parent's going to get frustrated. A parent is maybe sometimes going to yell at their kid when it's inappropriate to do so, and the child is going to be negatively affected by that, right? That happens, and that's not a big deal. The important thing is, is that, you know, ideally a parent is able to come back and make some kind of reparation, right? Like, um, and if it's, if it's like a, a really distressing situation, the parent is able to say, look, that was really not okay, and I'm really sorry. Were you scared, or were you when I raised my voice, or were you feeling sad that, you know, I, I said this or that, or whatever. Um, and there's this reconnection, right? And then everything's good. And, and then you move along, and, you know, things are fine. But if a child doesn't get that, if that never happens, then, again, there's, there's all this sort of emotional stuff that never gets disclosed, it never gets um, uh, properly attended to. So emotional attunement is where one must allow their state of mind to be influenced. I'm taking some liberty with the state of mind uh, language. To be influenced by that of the other person so they feel felt. There's this tacit understanding, this felt understanding. I'm not going to really go over that. Uh, I was, one way to kind of think about some of this, I, again, I do a lot of relationship work. And the kind of relationship that I, work that I do is, is heavily grounded in in uh, emotions, and so you can think about working with, you know, parent-child dynamics or uh, w with couples, romantic relationships, and it seems to me like there's this sort of emotional flow that ideally happens, and the way that I would describe it, there's like three, three moments or three parts in that dynamic, and the first part is um, a vulnerability of some sort, right, uh, that the person is able to, to be open or to disclose some vulnerability in what they're experiencing. Or the other person, like if it's a parent or something, they're able to draw that vulnerability out. And there's a vulnerability not, you know, not just in what a person says, you know, like, I feel really hurt, I feel betrayed, but the feeling is palpable. The feeling is in the room, so to speak, right? So there's a vulnerability. And the second moment is that the person who is receiving this is open enough in their own way of being that they can be moved by that. They're able to experience empathy for what this, this person is, is feeling. They're feeling something for them, right? You can almost think about as a bit of a Heideggerian gloss or a metaphor, right? It's like 
there's, it's like an opening of a clearing, like an existential or experiential clearing where two people are coming together and, you know, bearing witness to something or experiencing something in that moment together, right? So you have that vulnerability, you have empathy, feeling for this person. And then that third point is what we might call a kind of resonance, that the initial vulnerability, the person who, who disclosed that initial vulnerability or opened themselves up in that way, they can feel the significance of their emotions manifesting in another person. It matters to them. They feel attended to. They can experience themselves being felt by another, right? And if you have that, it's like this sort of beautiful thing where, where these emotions are, are kind of being regulated. There's a felt understanding, right? There's not a, just a cognitive understanding. It's a felt understanding. You feel that this person gets it. Now, the interesting thing about breaking it down into those three moments is that um, you can run into problems on any one of those three points, right? Which is interesting. So on the first point, you can have like what we call a breakdown in vulnerability. So the person is not actually disclosing a vulnerability. And this can happen when a person just uses emotionally laden words, right? They say, well, well you really upset me, or you bothered me, or you betrayed me, or you hurt me. The words are present. Again, we can go back to our five-point model of what an emotion is, right? We're only getting at the cognitive part of what, what this could be, but the emotion as it's felt has yet to disclose itself, right? Um, so it can break down on that level. And if someone is just engaging or trying to engage in a conversation about feelings and they're just dealing in terms of content, it's going to pull for, well, it's not going to pull for the most empathic response, right? Because there's no emotion to empathize with. You know, you, you have to do all the work yourself to imagine well, what would the emotion be or something. And it's more likely to pull for f content in turn. So now it turns into like a, a conceptual understanding of, of what the issue is. But it's, it's not really getting to the core of it. So there can be a breakdown at the level of vulnerability. There can be a breakdown at the level of that empathic response. So the first person may be vulnerable. The other person reacts, you know, in a way that is just totally detached or analytical. They see it maybe as a problem to be solved somehow, right? They might even say things, well, look, I don't have a time machine. What do you want me to do? I can't go back and do this over again, right? And there's a, a misunderstanding in a way, right? Like it's, it's like, yeah, no, we don't have time machines, but the, the emotion from the past is still present here, right? It's, it hasn't been disclosed. There's an opportunity. There's an invitation to connect with it in a different way, in a way that maybe you weren't able to uh, previously, right? Um, and then at the third moment, uh, there can be a breakdown. Uh, it took me a long time to notice this, that this can happen, but there, there can be a breakdown in that resonance. So the first person may momentarily, in a very skittish way, express a vulnerability. The other person has a very appropriate empathic response. And then the, third, the, the, the initial person closes off again, and they're not able to feel the significance of it. And they will say things like, well, you're saying all the right things, but that's just what you're supposed to say. Right? Or I don't believe you. Right? And as a therapist, you're like, well, what's not to believe? My God, their, their eyes are welling up in tears. Like, it feels real to me. Right? What's not to believe? And, and part of it is arguably the person closes off again. So there's arguably this, those three different points. A couple of things I, I just want to talk about. Um, we can talk about just some of the complexities with, with this. Can empathy, like, we think about can empathy reinforce inappropriate or irrational behavior? Like, is there a limit to our willingness to be empathic? Um, are we just reinforcing something that's, that's unhealthy? I, I think a lot of it depends on the context of the situation. Like one example would be in a therapy context, if a, a therapy client is saying, I'm feeling really judged now, right? Now you could, as a therapist, you can just jump in with all empathy. Oh my goodness, this must be so terrible for you. Like you're coming in here, you're paying good money, you're, you're looking for support and guidance and, and all that's happening is that you're feeling judged. What a terrible, awful experience. And, and a therapist can empathize with that. But there's the danger of potentially um, overly kind of reinforcing like that understanding of what's happening or something like that. Um, I don't think that, that you want to dismiss that, but I think, you know, one way, so essentially what's happening is that they're arguably, assuming that you're, you're not doing anything that could reasonably be received as, as judgment, 
what's happening possibly is, is the client is projecting into social possibilities, the possibility of judgment, the possibility of criticism and so on based on a prior familiarity. It doesn't have anything to do with the therapist necessarily. Right? This is what we call transference in the psychoanalytic jargon. So a different way of coming at that maybe would, would be, I mean, you could do a little bit of both. I think I, I generally prefer to do both. You can, you know, momentarily empathize a little bit with that, but then invite the question, well, look, is there anything about just the way that I'm engaging with you in the last few minutes? Is it anything about my tone of voice or just the way that I'm looking at you or my comments? Is there anything in there that, that strikes you as, as judgmental? Um, and if so, can we, can we talk about that? And, and if there isn't, then a person will, will know, and yet I still feel this way. Okay, so we do the rational shakedown. It doesn't seem like there's anything going on here in this moment, and yet that feeling is still there. So let's explore that feeling. Let's explore what that might be about. Um, pretty much the same thing in a, with a different gloss. We can talk about empathy versus agreeing with the specific interpretation or conceptual framing of uh, you know, reality or experience or whatever. Um, one example that, uh, that you know, might be able to draw this out. Um, I was working with a, with a, a 10 year old kid at one point and this is a kid who had uh, all kinds of issues with regulating his emotions. Like he just became very overwhelmed and um, you know, especially when there's a task that he's trying to do and he can't do it and he would just get so flustered and frustrated and he'd be pulling his hair out and he would just like hit his head against his desk and, and you know, sometimes clawed his skin and all this kind of stuff. And um, I was engaging with him to kind of help with some of that. And with kids, by the way, it's, it's really important if you can to get the parents involved to, because the parents are, you know, the ones that are mostly there to help support the child. And if they can do that in ways that they can feel good about and competent in, in doing that, uh, that, that, that can uh, make a, a big difference. So I was working with this kid and I was working with the father. The father was coming into some of the sessions. And at one point in one of our joint sessions, the father was asking, well, look, you know, all we want you to do, we just want you to try your best. We want you to just sit down at the dinner table and just, just do your homework. And it just seems like you can't sit there for longer than 10 minutes without just getting all upset and overwhelmed. Like, just try your best. We won't be mad at you. It's okay. Like, it's okay if you make mistakes. And, um, and the child is, is, you can look at him, right? They're sitting on the couch together. And the child is almost like looking away. And the sense is that, and you just know this from doing this often enough, the sense is that the child is feeling like the dad just doesn't get it, doesn't understand, doesn't get it. And in an individual appointment, he said as much, right? Like, he doesn't get it. He's just saying all this stuff because that's what moms and dads are supposed to say. He probably heard you, Brad, you know, tell him that's what he's supposed to say or he read it in a book somewhere. Like, that's just what all parents are supposed to say. So he doesn't believe it. He doesn't believe that the parent means these things, that we love you no matter what, it's okay, you can make mistakes, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we had another joint session and somewhere in the session the, the kid opens up and says, you know, I, I can't do it. It's, I, I'm just, I'm stupid. I'm dumb. I'm never going to get it. I, I can't do it. And what does the father say? Well, the father says what 95% of all parents would say in a situation like that. Oh, kiddo, you know, you're not stupid. You're really smart. Look at all the things that you've been able to overcome and do and, and other kids can't do this and, you know, you're, you're such a hard worker and blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. And again, the kid is, is feeling like, you, you don't get it, you don't understand. Like, none of this is, is sinking in at all. So I met with the father on his own. A lot of this work, by the way, is, is based on uh, Dan Hughes, his work on attachment-focused um, kind of family therapy work, if you're curious. But uh, so I said to the parents, I said, look, you know, I know it's probably really distressing for you as a father to hear your son talk about himself in this way. Right? Like, you don't see him in that way. He sees himself as stupid, as inadequate, as, you know, just not lovable, whatever. But what I want you to do is in the sessions going forward, I want you to work really hard at just trying to imagine what that would be like for him. And your number one job is not to convince him that it's not true. That's not your number one job. Not yet, anyway. Your number one job is to make sure that whatever he's feeling, that he's not alone in it. Just try to connect with whatever that experience is for him. So we had another session, 
And again, we get to this point where the, where the kid is saying something along those lines, I'm, I'm stupid, I can't do anything, I'm, I'm never gonna be able to do it, and so on. And the father in this moment, you know, kind of has this, he kind of checks himself for something, and then his, his eyes get a little bit kind of misty-eyed, and he turns to the kid and he says, um, you know, my God, that must be so hard for you. Like, you really feel this way about yourself? Like, you really, like, walking around every day and you feel like you, you're just dumb, that you're stupid, that you'll never be able to get it, that you're just not smart? Like, my God, that must be so hard. Like, my heart breaks knowing that this is what it's like for you. No wonder that's so hard. No wonder you get so overwhelmed. No wonder you get so frustrated. And in that moment, the kid's not turning away. He looks up like this, and he catches the glimpse of the father's face, and the father's visibly moved, you know, for his child. And just everything lets go, and the, and the kid just, like, turns into this blubbering mess of tears and accepts the father uh, holding him, embracing him. And there's this paradoxical thing, right? Like, we're, so here's this kid is arguably dealing with feelings of shame, right? That I'm not lovable, that I'm not important enough to care about. And in this moment, the father is able to understand, like, what a burden this is for him. And he feels in that moment that the father gets it. And again, paradoxically, in that moment, that my emotions matter to someone and I can experience myself mattering in that way. And arguably, that's, that's kind of how you move out of that, that stuff, right? Does that make sense? Yeah? Um, just a, co a couple comments on shame. Um, I've been sort of fascinated with, with shame as, as a concept and as, as you know, like a, a phenomenon. Um, it's my sense that, that shame is one of those emotions, is, it's arguably one of the most painful emotions, like feeling like you are worthless, like feeling that you have no significance, that there's no way in which you can matter in the world or to other people. Like it's just this, this you know, it's like this annihilation of the self, you know? And it's uh, often something I think that is, is it need, because it's so painful, it often needs to be hidden. It needs to be buried. It needs to be covered over. But you can often, um, you know, so when a person just makes fleeting little comments like, oh my God, I'm, I'm such an idiot, I can't do this right, or whatever, um, you can make, you know, punitive comments toward yourself or the negative self-talk or whatever, but the feeling itself doesn't show up. I mean, it may intimate that the feeling is somewhere in there, but you're not experiencing it. But you can get a sense of this with, you know, the responses that, that try to avoid the feeling of shame, you know, and so you see this... Um, in relationship work when one partner is expressing like some distressing feeling like uh, look I was really hurt by this thing that happened the other day and blah 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 and then the other person gets defensive well, why are you getting defensive right they didn't say like and it's your fault like they didn't do anything like that so what is this defensiveness about like what would it mean like if your actions like inadvertently I presume cause this person to feel upset or hurt or sad or whatever like, what would that mean if that were true? Now, a healthy individual who has, like, a secure attachment dynamic, they can feel guilt, right? And what is guilt? Well, guilt is feeling bad about something that you did, right? Well, what you did is in the past, right? It's not this ongoing sense of who you are, right? You f I'm, I'm a caring, lovable, you know, well-intentioned human being. And you know what? I make mistakes and I hurt people and I feel bad about those times and moments when I hurt people. There's a guilty feeling. And empathy is a natural you know, kind of uh, feeling that, that runs alongside that. But someone who, who has like a, a shame-based disposition, they can't feel guilt in that way. It's like when they do something wrong or their actions suggest, you know, that it's hurt someone, immediately there's the possibility of feeling shame. It's, it's not evidence that I've, I've done something wrong. It's evidence that I'm bad and that I'm no good. And so I have to defend myself against this. I have to explain myself, I have to rationalize it, I have to turn it around somehow and make it about you. Um, so there's an avoidance, you know, kind of at work, um, which is just interesting to, uh, to, uh, to see that. So when you work with people around this stuff, you, you just try to help them notice, like, well, my God, like, well, hold on a sec, let's do a timeout. Like, your partner just expressed, you know, this vulnerable feeling. And, and do you notice how, do you notice like what's going on right now? Like, how would you say you're describing your body? I would call it defensiveness. What would you call it? No, I think it's defensive. 
So what is, what is that, though? Because your partner, I don't think they phrased it in a way that, that seemed to accuse you. I think they just said this is their interpretation of what happened and how they felt. How could they communicate their feelings without you hearing it as a criticism, right? Is that possible? Now, if that's not possible, then, then you know, there's something funny going on, but surely that should be possible, right? Um, and so what is this about? Like, because if, if you're receiving this as an attack, that means that, like, I don't know, like, um, aren't you being, like, really hard on yourself? Like, can't you cut yourself enough slack that you can just, you can make mistakes, right? I don't think she's saying or he's saying that, that you did this intentionally, that you're trying to hurt them. I don't think that's possible. Surely it should be possible that you make mistakes or you do something unintentionally or that it hurts someone else that, that you, you care about. So you just try to help them notice like different parts of what's going on and uh, uncover some of the relevant, uh, relevant feelings. Um, just in the interest of time, I think I'm going to stop there. I do have the reflection paper, so stick around. We've got five minutes left, and I'll just have you guys comment on, again, just how you're finding the class.